Uh, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Who... Ah. No, it's not. Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are on this planet. Um, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for joining us for this uh, Google Hangout. Uh, today is a special day for the SETI Institute since uh, we are going to talk about the publication uh, in the prestigious science journal on the analysis of the Sutter Mills meteorite. Um, well, first of all, I should introduce my, uh, our speakers. Um, I'm Frank Marchis. I'm a senior researcher at the SETI Institute. I work on asteroids. On my right, we have Peter Janinsken, uh, the leader of this, um, of this research, uh, who is also studying meteor meteors, asteroids, and meteorites. Uh, nearby Peter, we have Derek Sears. Um, he's a researcher at, the, at NASA Ames, and he studies meteorites in general. Online, we have uh, Alex Witze from Science um, News. Uh, she is going to moderate this uh, Google Hangout. Um, <clears throat> but first of all, we should really go straight to the point. Um, could you tell us, Peter, what exactly is a Sutter Mills meteorite and why this is such an important discovery? Uh, Sutter Mill, um, the Sutter Mill meteorite fell last April, April 22nd, after a very loud boom was heard uh, over the Sierra Nevada in California. Um, it turns out to be a primitive uh, type of a meteorite. And uh, it's the first time uh, in a while that we uh, had really quick uh, access to uh, a freshly fallen primitive um, meteorite. Alex? Do you yeah. Have I, I want to go ahead and just uh, follow this story up because it's kind of an amazing discovery from when it was first spotted to the analysis um, all the way through to the publication today. I, I want to ask Peter to just talk a little bit more about um, how you heard about the meteor in the first place and how you went about recovering the fragments. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact that it was such a loud boom, of course, uh, created quite a stir in, uh, over the Sierra Nevada area. Uh, everywhere around Lake Tahoe, people were uh, asking, what was this? Uh, houses were shaking, cars were, uh, were shaking, and uh, it was, uh, was an event. Uh, and so we quickly heard about that and realized that uh, here we had not just a meteorite fall, but uh, a really big meteorite fall, something substantial coming in, uh, a small little world, if you like, a few meter size object. Now, if that's the case, uh, I am uh, sitting straight and I'm thinking, oh, wow. Here, maybe, we have another chance to really see how strange an asteroid can be if once it gets to, a, to the size of a few meters. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was this asteroid that was seen coming in that actually hit the Earth. It was called Asteroid 2008 TC3, and it hit the north of Sudan. And uh, I, was, uh, I teamed up with the uh, University of Khartoum researchers at the time, and with their students, we found pieces of it. And that turned out to be a really mixed bag of things. Lots of uh, very rare meteorites that were all sort of uh, together in this one asteroid. So here was another uh, big thing coming in. So immediately I thought, hey, uh, what, what surprises are in store? Right. So um, actually, Derek, I wanted to ask you, um, when did you hear about the meteorite and how did you become involved in the analysis? Oh, I think the, the day it happened, the emails were flying fast and furious, and I think we, we were having meetings at Ames to, to do other sorts of research, and the place was just humming with excitement. Peter came in, waving various documents around um, that, that he'd, he'd, you know, emails he'd been exchanging, uh, and so just generally the whole, the whole place got absorbed into this, 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 this excitement. Something big had happened. It was heard, but they heard the big noise over Tahoe, but uh, there were reports coming in from all over the North Bay area. I mean, and from, from parts of Nevada. I mean, this was a big event. And then we were starting to get reports from people who'd got equipment set up who, who, who were based in, in Huntsville, Alabama, were sending us reports about something big happening. So, um, so that's how we heard about it. The scientists, the meteorite scientists at Ames, just, uh, and at SETI, just got, um, got, got ignited by this thing. And then, and then Peter sort of sorted us all out and got us organized and uh, uh, organized uh, systematic searches of the area. And there were, I remember there were a few of us who couldn't wait for the official search and they shot off straight away. You were one of them, right? And um, that, that's basically how I got involved. It was just uh, being sucked into the general euphoria that, that this event created. 
Right. Peter, t tell us about the search. I mean, um, I I've heard that, for instance, you had volunteers kind of line up and hold a rope and kind of walk across the countryside looking for bits and pieces, and there was a Zeppelin involved to look for impact craters. Tell us about how you went about looking for these bits. Yes, it's not easy to uh, search for, for these meteorites. They scatter over a really big area. They're hard to find. Uh, these days, um, and the first thing you do when there is a, a really big fireball and something uh, could have landed is to check and see if the falling meteorites were, are detected by Doppler weather radars, if they see sort of a hail. And the person who pioneered that tool is Mark Fries of the Planetary Science Institute. So the first thing I did when I heard about this big room is contact Mark and ask Mark, please check the Doppler weather radar data and see if, if you could see something coming down. And Mark immediately came back next day when uh, all the, the radar data were in, saying, yes, there is a, a, a big footprint that looks like uh, meteorites coming down over the Coloma and Lotus area. That was the first uh, clue we had. And right at that point, we knew, uh, basically, we had a general area, uh, still more, almost seven by four kilometer size area, uh, where, uh, where things came down. So and Peter, yeah. can you just remind us where Lotus and Coloma are? Okay, it's, it's in gold country. If yeah. you know California, then you know that uh, the state was made by the gold rush back in uh, 1849. Thousands of people that immigrated to California, they all wanted to find a piece of gold. They wanted to become rich. And uh, it was a, a really uh, uh, the biggest sort of mass migration of people uh, that happened up to that point. It was an incredible event. And uh, our meteorites, the Sutter's Mill meteorites, fell at the very spot where the gold rush started, where the first gold was found, which was incredible. One of the pieces was found actually at the site where gold was first discovered. And so, uh, so this is, uh, uh, for people living in California, a very famous, famous area. It's these days uh, vacation uh, territory. Uh, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, area to visit. Right. A whole area for me, right? So how many pieces? Hard, hard, hard place for meteorites to fall because it's very hilly, uh, very uh, vegetated. Uh, not an easy, uh, not an easy place to search. So how many pieces did you find? Uh, well, uh, uh, so the uh, it, uh, of course once the news got out that I mean, so okay. So the first uh, thing we the idea after talking with Derek and uh, uh, we came up with a strategy to um, bring groups of volunteers together and to search in areas where uh, we had permission to search, um, in public lands and uh, property owners that gave us permission to search. Um, the first public land we uh, recognized was uh, the Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park. This is the historic park that was settled uh, to commemorate this gold rush. And so I met uh, next day with uh, Jeremy McReynolds from the, the park superintendent and discussed uh, th this plan to come with volunteers. And while I was in Jeremy's office, I uh, heard that uh, Robert Ward, a meteorite hunter in Arizona, had found the first meteorite. And that he had identified it as a primitive asteroid, a rare type of asteroid. So that was very exciting. After the meeting, uh, I was shown around to the various public areas in the, in the region. Uh, and we ended up at the same park where uh, Robert had found the meteorite. Uh, we parked the car, we walked around at the park, we looked for an hour and couldn't find anything. And so I'm, I'm back at the car, I'm waiting for my friend to open the car, I'm standing there uh, impatiently. And uh, while I'm standing there, I see these, these couple of little black rocks on the pavement. And I'm thinking, hmm. And uh, I collected those. And how did how did you know? Did they look different than ordinary uh, rocks? Initially, I wasn't certain. Initially, I just collected them, and I thought, hmm, uh, it was uh, actually uh, I was uh, we, we were we were standing there talking about it uh, when we noticed that there was an, another person in our area who was sort of looking around, a big NASA stick on his back, and so we thought we ought to introduce ourselves, and that turned out to be Robert Ward. <laughs> so when when we met him, we thought, oh, we. Uh, I want to see his piece, so tell me, show me what you found. And when he showed his meteorite, I really knew, oh, I have some of that as well. <laughs> and that's how we, uh, we recognized that uh, we actually had found uh, a second piece of this, uh, of this meteorite. And by that time, it was just two days after the fall. There had been no rain. Uh, it was really as pristine as you can, uh, as you can find it. Um, with the um, uh, footnote that uh, my meteorite was driven over by a car, it was crunched into a couple of small pieces. 
So he, did that sort of hurt the science that you were going to get out of it? Uh, interestingly enough, it did not. <laughs> because the pieces were pretty big. It was a, a very nice sort of a centimeter size uh, chunks. And uh, you can still see on one of the pieces a little bit of the fusion crust on the side here that uh, that is really uh, uh, a piece of the surface. So, so yeah, it was, uh, was incredible material to have. And so, Derek, how did you first do some of this analysis in your lab? Like, when did you first get pieces, and, and, and what kind of studies did you do on them? Well, I, I kind of held back. We had, I think we had the sampler names for three or four weeks before Peter gave me a piece. And I was holding back because for the sort of work I do, I can't, I can't really do much with CM chondrites, with this, this type of meteorite. Um, Why is that? The, well, the technique I use in, requires that you have crystals uh, in, in the rock. You have to have, the minerals have to be in the form of crystals. They don't have to be big, and they don't have to be a lot of them. But usually with this type of meteorite, the, there is so much um, uh, chemistry has been going on, active chemistry, that most of the minerals have been converted to, to, to the sorts of um, clay-like minerals um, which really don't don't produce much of a signal for me. So I held back. And then the report started coming in from the, the people looking at the rock. Uh, the mineralogists and the petrologists were coming back saying, this is not a normal CM. Uh, and then they started saying it looks like it's been, the technical word is metamorphosed, it's been baked on a parent body. It's been yeah. D Derek, can we just interrupt real quickly and can you just sure. tell the audience again what CM meteorites are? CM. This is the class of meteorite that Sutter's Mills turned out to be. Um, we divide the meteorites into various mega groups, if, if, if you will, and one of the mega groups is the C groups. That, 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 originally that meant these were the carbon-bearing meteorites. Um, and then you divide the carbon-bearing meteorites into subgroups depending on their detailed properties. And they, can, they actually can vary quite a bit from one type, one group to another. Uh, and then this particular subgroup of the carbonaceous meteorite um, uh, has a very famous, has a couple of very famous members that everybody's familiar with. One's called Murchison and one's called Maguey. And uh, so we call these the C meteorites of the Maguey type, so CM for short. Um, On. Do I still have a voice? Um, so anyway, these are meteorites which are, as Peter said, among the most interesting in the sense that they're the most primitive. And by most primitive, we mean that they're most solar. They're most like the solar surface. If you took the solar surface, Peter must be fed up with hearing me say this now. <laughs> if you take the solar surface and, and took it down into your office, you know, you're able to grab a handful of the sun's surface and put it down in your office and let it cool to room temperature. Basically, this is what you get. So these meteorites are, are solar, and that's what we mean by primitive. Now, the CMs are not absolutely bang on solar. They're, they're missing some things that don't condense at room temperature, helium, hydrogen, oxygen, inert gases, and so on. Um, but they're damn close. And uh, one thing that characterizes these, these particular rocks is since they were formed into a solid rocky material, it seems like an awful lot of water has been pumped through them. So the parent bodies that these meteorites are coming from, at some point or another, and maybe still, we don't know, they've had running water going through them. Now you think carbon-rich rock with running water, and you start to get goosebumps thinking about prospects for, for life. I mean, this has got to be one of the huge questions in human intellectual effort, is, is how did life arise? Um, and here we have these really old, primitive solar materials, 4.6 billion years old. That, that's the age that's coming back to this rock. Um, so you've got these ancient materials, carbon-rich, water flowing through it. Could they possibly give us some clue as to the origins of life? So anyway, I'm digressing. You asked me what a CM meteorite was. And that's, that's, basically, that's basically it. It's this, this clay-rich, muddy. It's like a mud ball with water in, but it's got a lot of cool other things in it, but it's, but it's got the same composition as the sun. So anyway, these types of mud balls I can't do much with in my lab. But when the report started coming back that there'd been some geology going on, then I started to get very interested because that is something that I'm very interested in and my technique can do. So and what, what do you mean by geology going on? Um, the metamorphism. Okay. 
the, the, these rocks have been heated up in their parent body, and that's caused this amorphous material, this non-crystalline material, to start to crystallize a little bit. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of de details. This is the big picture. Um, so th at that point, I said to Peter, when are you going to give me a piece? And he gave me two nice pieces. In fact, I think he let me pick my own, which is very generous. And uh, I put them through my lab. And uh, I think within a, a few weeks, um, I got some data that I was really quite pleased with. And we wrote an abstract for a, a meeting in Australia. Uh, and that's essentially how I've got to how I've got to be involved. So um, so it's it's been fun. It's been it's been fun. So how many experiments have been done on these rocks? Because uh, I, I read uh, this paper yeah. and there is a gazillion of them. But yeah, it's a gazillion. <laughs> uh, a number, yeah. We uh, we have seventy authors on this paper. Uh, the document comes with a seventy-two page supporting online materials document that describes all the individual investigations. So. There's been a lot of different things looked at. And all of this research was done within two months after the fall fell. And so, uh, so it's, it's extraordinary how many people came together and wanted to study this and wanted to learn about this. Uh, it, for me, it was uh, really exciting because uh, I, um, in the beginning, uh, uh, I realized that if, we, if there's a small world coming in, I want to uh, later be able to um, understand where specific aspects of me where specific types of meteorites, specific materials were in the original asteroid. And for that I needed to keep track of where the different meteorites were found. So when somebody would find a Sutter's Mill meteorite, I would uh, ask them to please send me a picture. Uh, I, I could then confirm that it really was. And then I would record the find location and the person who found it. And so that way, uh, uh, if the meteorite makes it into a research collection, it's being studied, we can then later relay that information back to the, uh, to the asteroid. So I was getting these emails in from people finding black rocks. And a lot, of course, a lot of them were not really meteorites, but some of them were. And when, when it was a Sutter's Mill meteorite, uh, that was very exciting, because then you sort of share the joy, and you, uh, you, you get really uh, right into the excitement of finding little treasure. But at this, when that all was happening, I was also getting these emails from uh, researchers like Derek who, who found interesting little things. And very quickly, sort of a second gold rush was going on by the scientists who were finding one peculiar thing after the other. It was very quickly clear that this was not your, as far as there is in a, a normal CM1, right? it's not your normal CM1, right? it has all sorts of interesting aspects to it that, uh, that are unusual. And uh, that was very exciting. That's, uh, that, so this was a very, very enjoyable experience. Right. Peter, I want to ask sort of about where the meteorite came from in terms of what asteroid it came from and what trajectory it came on to Earth. Um, I think you told me earlier that this was one of the fastest meteorites when it hit the atmosphere. I mean, where, how was it coming in and how can you trace back to where it came from? We were uh, extremely lucky with this one um, because uh, some uh, we we got beautiful photographs from this uh, from this uh, fireball coming in. Let's see if I can find the yeah. Uh, first, uh, a very nice uh, series of photographs taken by Lisa Warren from Rancher Haven, north of Reno. She had a digital camera in her hand, and she had a frame of mind. As soon as she saw the fireball in the sky, to aim the camera up and take three pictures while the meteor was going through, through the air, and which is incredible because this thing moved pretty fast as far as fireballs are concerned. And those pictures are stunning. They show very nicely the track of the fireball, how it's moving. And they also show that when she took the picture, just after there was a big explosion, you can still see the red sort of uh, afterglow from that explosion, you can see that it's a slew of pieces coming down. It has broken up into thousands of fragments. And those were the fragments that were later seen falling down by the Doppler weather radar. So we had Lisa's pictures. We also had a, a beautiful video taken by um, Sean Bollock from a location uh, south of um, um, uh, Sequoia National Park, uh, where he was just filming the landscape with a nice wide-angle camera. And sure enough, uh, he filmed the beginning part of the fireball. So you see the fireball disappear behind the hills. But the beginning part is really important to me because it uh, shows how fast this thing came in. And so right. combining Lisa's and Sean's video and a, a security camera footage that was taken at Lake Tahoe, 
which helped us confirm it. You saw the sort of the last all the slew of fragments come in in the top corner there, uh, above above the lake. It's beautiful, beautiful video. Uh, by combining all three, we were able to uh, calculate the track of this uh, of this asteroid coming in and uh, the speed in which it came in. And the, the one thing that was immediately clear was that this thing came in super fast, as fast as meteorites are concerned. 28.6 kilometers per second, which is the fastest ever uh, object that I know of for which something was recovered on the ground. Right. These conditions were violent because we think that uh, this asteroid was like, was about uh, 40,000 kilograms, about 100,000 pounds heavy when it came in the Earth's atmosphere rock about three meters in size. And uh, once uh, it went through this whole process, hitting the atmosphere, and falling into pieces, evaporating, uh, everything that, that fell on the ground, at least the material that's recovered so far, is less than one kilo. It's less than two pounds. So uh, very little surprise. Yeah. So, uh, so then uh, once, uh, once we have the trajectory and we know how fast it came in the Earth's atmosphere, we can calculate the orbit in space. And uh, the orbit was stunning. It was really interesting to see. Uh, the orbit was very elongated. This, uh, the Saturn's Mill meteorite uh, came from just uh, inside of Jupiter's orbit and uh, came all the way into the inner solar system uh, close to the orbit of Mercury. And uh, that sort of uh, eccentric orbit is also uh, unique for as far as, uh, as meteorites falls are concerned. And I was really uh, puzzled by this by this trajectory because this is not typically how asteroids are uh, hitting the Earth, how asteroids are coming. This orbit actually looks more like that of a comet, like a comet uh, the short period comets that uh, were once caught by Jupiter and that then uh, were thrown into the inner part of the solar system. This, uh, this is a very unusual track. And uh, I was very excited to find that there was actually uh, another uh, uh, meteorite found, a CM meteorite called Maribo, for which a preliminary trajectory was published that also uh, came very close to, the, to the, uh, the orbit of Mercury. And so when I asked the researchers in Germany, uh, Werner Singer and his team at uh, Jungs, uh, the Kulungsborn, uh, to, uh, if, if the data were available for analysis, he, he, he made those available, uh, I calculated the orbit, and I found that the orbit was really similar to that of Saturn's mill also just inside of Jupiter's orbit and coming just to the, to the orbit of, of Mercury. And uh, so, so here is a, is a group of meteorites that are coming in on these peculiar elongated orbits. Now that was one thing. Um, what Sutter's Mill, the Sutter's Mill orbit uh, gave us, gave us uh, two things. Um, it, it showed us that these meteorites are coming in on really uh, uh, shallowly inclined orbits. It means that they, they move in the plane of the planets. They're not tilted out of it. They're really moving in that uh, shallow inclined orbit. That means that the source where these objects are coming from also does that. They also move in a very shallowly inclined orbit. The other thing that Saturn Small gave us, and Maribo as well, is that uh, the, uh, the asteroids, the meteors that are hitting the Earth, are moving around the Sun in uh, Basically, uh, it, they go three times around the sun when Jupiter goes around one time. And if you have exactly this ratio, three to one, uh, then you have an unstable orbit. And, and that, it's, that instability is what, uh, what makes these orbits so eccentric and what makes these orbits ultimately come to the Earth and make it possible to hit. Um, so what Sutter-Smell and Maribo did was they pointed us to the very... Uh, uh, resonance, the very uh, unstable uh, orbital time that uh, these objects had to have uh, for, for, uh, for the source region. So because uh, if Saturn's Mill and Maribel have this, also the objects where these are coming from, they are also moving about uh, three times around the Sun when uh, Jupiter goes around one time. So we now know that the, the place where these objects are coming from is um, uh, is basically very close to the 3 to 1 resonance with Jupiter, and the objects are moving in a, in a low inclined orbit. So just to clarify, yeah. that, uh, you think that these Maribo and Sutter's Mill come from the same, same source. source? Yes, because that's one thing very interesting about uh, CM Gondrides as a group, they all come out of the asteroid belt very recently. They're all less than 2 million years old in terms of having been broken from a, from a bigger object. 
And usually the idea is that things break, and then the very small pieces very quickly get uh, change their orbits, they end up in these resonances, and then they're being sent our way. And so uh, we are seeing a constant uh, flood of this small stuff coming our way, uh, small chunks of, uh, of uh, CM gondrides. And apparently, uh, Sutter's Mill and Maribor came in on very similar orbits. So uh, we're also shallow inclined, uh, treat one resonance. So I think they're from the same source, despite the fact that these are very different looking meteorites. So this, this, the, the, the group of asteroids where they come from, uh, it probably is very diverse as a, as, a, as a group. So this is uh, very exciting for me to see. Now, Sutter's Mill has another really interesting aspect, and that is that uh, it was in space, since it broke from a bigger piece, only about 50,000 to 90,000 years, which is very know? recent. That's, that's determined, uh, this was done by uh, uh, part of our, uh, our, our team here, uh, 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 quite a group of different researchers participated in this analysis, but it is done by looking at how uh, long the rock is exposed to cosmic rays. Cosmic rays hit this rock and they create nuclear reactions. They create rare uh, elements that decay, nuclear decay, and you can actually detect those in the, in the meteorite. And so from how many there are, what levels there are in the, in the rock, you can determine how long was the rock exposed to these, to these cosmic rays. And for subtle smell, that was very recent. So, um, uh, with, yeah. yeah uh, I, I just want to follow up on that. Um, I just want to follow up on what that means for studies of the meteorite, and maybe this is something that Derek can answer, but I talk to scientists a lot who talk about meteorites containing very primitive material, and then the other word you hear a lot is fresh. I hear that word a lot with Sutter's Mill, and by fresh, I think maybe you're talking about how recently it broke off. What does that mean for you, Derek, when you're actually in the lab? How significant is it to you to have, quote unquote, fresh meteorite? Um, yeah, yeah, by fresh, we, in this context, I think what we mean is that we picked it up off the ground soon after it fell. Okay. Um, th this meteorite is, well, this type of meteorite, the CMs, can be up to 10 volume percent water. You just think about that, a rock that's, whose volume is 10 percent water. Um, it's basically a mud ball. Sutter's Mill is unusual in that it's got relatively little water compared to most CMs. But nevertheless, it, it has water, and you know, water is, you know, <laughs> for most scientists, it's a, it's a great joy and it's a big nuisance because it is a sort of molecule that is very sticky and it is very small. So that molecule can can easily diffuse its way into rocks. Um, it, it, it's it's present in the atmosphere. There's a lot of water vapor in, in our atmosphere. It's very unusual to find an environment that doesn't have a lot of water. So the water in the meteorite exchanges with the water in the atmosphere very, very quickly. And if that meteorite is sitting in a puddle, then there you go. You're going to get a lot of exchange. So these meteorites get contaminated very quickly. There's a, there's a, there's a story of a meteorite that fell in France in 1803, I think it was, that was out in the field for just a few weeks. And when they got it back into the lab, it was full of pollen grains. Uh, so and that, that at the time, it was thought this was live living organisms in a meteorite, which it was, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it turned out to be contamination. So contamination is a huge problem in meteorite studies, and, and it depends a little bit on what type of meteorite. But these CMs are so sensitive, and they also contain such interesting molecules scientifically, all these carbon-bearing molecules, for example, in water, that uh, it's the meteorites that are most sensitive that have the most to give. Uh, if, if they weren't being contaminated. So that's what we mean by fresh. This, this, is, this is pretty much as it was before it entered the atmosphere. Right. Keep it coming through the atmosphere, but, um, but essentially it, that's what we mean by fresh. Now, what was your other point? Um, I think that was it, primitive. pretty much. Yeah, primitive. Primitive, primitive <laughs> we mean what I said earlier, that it's essentially a yeah. composition. Uh, right. Now, we can have meteorites falling, most meteorites that fall, in fact, we would not regard as, quote, primitive. Uh, most meteorites were formed 4.6 billion years ago uh, um, from the same process we presume that formed the sun and the planets. And, um, but like the planets underwent global melting to produce a core, a mantle, and a crust. Uh, you know, most meteorites went through some form of heating process, which really changed their properties. Um, but these, it, it, but, but in the meteorite context, we really mean those that are just as they were made in the, uh, at T zero, um, and they've they've actually had very little alteration on their parent bodies uh, since they were formed. 
Do you have questions on the web or? One of the uh, the really interesting things, uh, uh, one of the really interesting things uh, I think that ca came out of Satos Mail was that Satos Mail was not just a a, a, ch a CM gone right one chunk. It was actually a mix of things, and mm -hmm. there I can can I can refer to that because he studied this aspect. Uh, the the mix of things was uh, was seen when you see when you X-ray CT scan these these meteorites and. Uh, for the first time, really, a lot of these uh, meteorites were scanned that way, and uh, this is one of those scans taken at the uh, American Natural uh, History Museum. You can see all these little dotted areas, all different class, different chunks of something different, something different material uh, present in this meteorite. Does that mean that it's formed by flashing a bunch of? Uh, this this is yeah, right? Peter. I've got two microphones now. This ah. is what Peter, as, as Peter alluded to, this, this is what got me excited earlier on. In I mean. One of the many things that got me excited, but um, at one point we sent a section of this piece. Well, uh, my student back in Arkansas got a hold of a piece of this um, um, meteorite, and, and he was looking at slices. And he took a photograph and he circulated the the, the image, and it just—it's um, not like I think of CM meteorites as, as just being these mud balls. This, this meteorite actually consists of rocks within rocks. So you have a, a, a rock that's mixed in with some sort of dirt-like material. We call it matrix because we don't really know what it is. It's the stuff that surrounds the rocks. We call the rocks clasts. So, so this is a meteorite that consists of a jumble of stuff. It, it has these clasts of normal-ish CM stuff, and then it has this matrix which looks really messy, bits and pieces of crushed this and that. It's a bit like the, the lunar regolith. You know, you're familiar with what they call the lunar soil, the lunar regolith. This is a regolith. So it, it, it's this, the surface of an asteroid. It basically. means it's come from the very surface of the asteroid. So yeah. it, 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 and that might explain a lot of its strange properties. It's been right there on the very surface. It's been peppered and peppered and peppered with with, with impacts, and most of them very fine, tiny micrometeorites. And it's churned it all up. It's been gardened. So it's a bit like your garden soil with stones and, and fine stuff. So so this is. This puts us in a whole new type of science. Because now, now instead of looking at how did this stuff condense down out of a nebula gas to make these solid material, now we're looking at something going on on an asteroid surface. Now, now we start to think in a different way. We think about impact gardening. We think of heat and vapors coming up from the inside. We, we think of a whole different environment. And um, this kind of is important from a large number of, for several reasons. One is we, it means we now have a what they call a witness plate for space. I mean, what is the space environment like? This this meteorite saw open space. It saw 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 deep space. So, what is that environment like? We can see it in the rock. Um, it also means when we start to put spacecraft down on asteroids, as a lot of us want to do, and, and some of us have already done, when we put spacecraft down on asteroids for the human exploration program, for the science planetary science program. We're going to want to know what we're standing on, and we're going to want to know what it's like. Uh, can we put our weight down on it? Are we, are we landing on cotton wool fluff balls? Um, can, you know, what are the challenges that we're going to encounter as we try and do things on this asteroid, as we try and move ourselves around, try and move equipment around, try and take samples? Um, so this is really giving us an inkling of what it's going to be like when we get out there and start exploring asteroids with robots and with, with human missions. So there's a, um, a cliche in science journalism where everything is a Rosetta Stone. You know, a, a rock like this might be a Rosetta Stone for understanding a lot of different mysteries about the universe. It sounds like that cliche might actually be accurate in the case of the Sutter's Mill rock. Um, I'm, you're right. Yeah. They're all Rosettas. <laughs> They're all Rosetta Stones. <laughs> So I know we're running. I know we're running short on time, and and Frank can wrap us up. But I wondered actually if I could just ask ask Frank a question himself, not as a moderator, but as a scientist. I mean, what to you is the greatest significance of this find, and and what might this this interesting little rock that fell in such an interesting way over California, what might that tell us about our place in the solar system? Oh, you keep the most complicated <laughs> the most complicated question for me. Um, First of all, I will just say that uh, when this event happened and when I saw how my colleagues here 
conducting his research, I was very impressed. And that's this research, this result is really important in a way that it shows how scientists around the world can collaborate. And that's one thing I would like to, to emphasize here. The second point is that this discovery and the discovery of a pristine meteorite like this one, um, let's, let's see the context. In the next 10 years, uh, all space agencies in the world, uh, in Japan, in Europe, and in, in the US, are going to send spacecraft around C-type asteroid, and in the goal of with the goal of bringing back a sample. Well, Peter and his team with this research find already a sample of a of a, C, a carbonation of a C-type asteroid, most likely. So this is the first time we have a window on the path of the of the C-type asteroid, and we can finally understand how this C-type asteroid formed. And I think this is a very significant result. I, I have a point I'd like to add, if, if, if that's okay. That um, Peter and, and, and Frank mentioned the you know, in, in, in incredible international collaboration that, that, that Peter put together here with scientists all over the world and of all types, all, all subject matter. Um, and then you also mentioned when you were describing the initial discoveries how it was a meteorite dealer who actually picked up the first piece, and that dealer was more than willing to share his information with Peter. Um, it's been a great joy for me to be involved in, in this and to watch how, how these things are organized. But the, the, the lesson I've come away with is you had a hundred or so people in the field. You had researchers, you had meteorite dealers, you had members of the public, you had the state parks people. And the degree of collaboration and enthusiasm uh, amongst a hundred people, they had one thing in common. They were passionate about finding meteorites. Some of them going to get money as well. Some of them were going to get other sorts of rewards. But the point is, I think what Sutter's Mill demonstrated to me was how these very diverse people uh, can, can, can come together and produce incredible results uh, despite having come at the problem from very different directions. So there the, was the, an innate passion for rocks from space that, that was a, a privilege to watch. Well, I think that's a perfect way to conclude this discussion. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thanks again, uh, Alex Witsi, for moderating this debate. Our speakers, Derek Sears from NASA Ames, Peter Janinsken from SETI Institute, the Carl Sagan Center, to be more precise. Um, well, these were clearly our light. Uh, the goal of the new campaign of the SETI Institute, which is called Communicate, and I think we have, we have shown, shown today that communication in science is important, and uh, we would like to encourage all of you uh, the viewers and people who are going to see this video later on on YouTube to uh, to join us, to join us uh, by joining our uh, Google Plus account, Facebook, or Twitter, but also by joining joining our City Stars uh, uh, campaign. And uh, thank you very much. Have a great uh, New Year uh, season, and um, see you next year for another Asteroids, most likely. And as a meteorite, next year in May. Yeah, <laughs> we had a we had a massive fireball just just yesterday. Uh, at uh, uh, half past five, so uh, who knows? Uh, I, we, we suspect that this one plunged in the ocean, but who knows? Uh, okay. there'll, there'll certainly be another one coming. So see you in 2013 to talk about another meteorite. Uh, you're very lucky, so I'm sure you're going to find something else again. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Alex.